Hello. So it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you on this beautiful evening. Uh, my name is Edward Kopp. I'm the chief curator of the Menil Drawing Institute and uh, also the co-curator with Kim Konati of um, Ruth Azawa Through Line. And I have to say it's a special evening for us uh, in many ways. Um, I think the artists would have loved uh, the Menil campus, its nature, she would have loved the weather. And we are very happy to, be, to have in our midst uh, some uh, members of the Yazawa family. So uh, thank you for coming. And so we organized this exhibition, we at the Menil, in collaboration with the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. And the show opened there in the fall and is with us here at the Menil in its current incarnation until July 21st. So please come again and again and again. And it's, well, it's not the first exhibition on Azawa to feature um, some of our drawings. It's the first exhibition that really um, focuses on this practice of Earth, which was a lifelong practice and also a very expansive practice. And this has been a re revelation to many, especially uh, people who thought of her first and foremost as a sculptor. And before I introduce our speaker this evening, um, I want to bring to your attention some upcoming uh, public programs at the Manila. On April 24th, uh, there will be a conversation titled Connecting Lines, Janet Sobel and Abstract Expressionism. And then on May 9th, there will be a panel discussion on Ruth Azawa, Art and Life. And so the artist's daughter, uh, Adi Lanier, and Marilyn Chase, a biographer, will discuss how Ruth Azawa's art and life were closely intertwined. Uh, I'd like to remind you to please silence your cell phones. Um, also, this program is being recorded, and it will be made available in the next few days on the Menil's YouTube channel. So now, let's turn to our speaker, Jordan Toller. Thank you for coming all the way from Germany, Jordan. So she is Junior Professor of Contemporary Art History and Aesthetic Practices at the Institute for Fine Arts, Music and Education at Lofana University in Lüneburg, Germany. Her research interests lie in the field of modern contemporary art in the US, in Europe, but also Latin America, and including topics such as sculpture and sexuality, craft, textiles, fiber art, photography, um, as well as archival practices, exile and diasporic visual culture. So she obtained a, um, a BA from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD at Harvard, and her um, doctoral dissertation was on Bauhaus photography. She's published some very interesting articles, uh, essays on Azawa, including one in these uh, exhibitions uh, accompanying publication. And in addition, uh, she's been working on a book manuscript titled Ruth Azawa and the Artist's Mother at Mid-Century. It is the first study to explore the central role that the experience of motherhood play in post-war modernism. And she, the book will come out with MIT Press next year. Uh, Jordan will take some questions at the end of a lecture, which is titled Durable Fragility, Ruth Azawa and the Materiality of Line. So please join me in welcoming Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, and also to the team here at the Manil for making it possible to, especially Tony Martinez and Mary, Magsamen, um, but also a huge thanks to the Asawa estate, who have really done so much to make their mother and grandmother's work uh, available to a broader public. So to turn to the topic at hand, Ruth Asawa's drawings, occasioned by this incredible exhibition, an exhibition in which we see firsthand and as Edward mentioned, for the first time in the history of her works exhibition, his the vast range and complexity of her approach to the medium of drawing. So what I'm gonna present this evening will not only be a glimpse into that diversity, 
its spectrum of technique and subject matter. But it will also try to give that corpus an argumentative shape and to convince you of a set of terms whereby that heterogeneity adheres into a coherent whole. For Asawa is, or has been until now at least, an artist most immediately understood as a sculptor, working in the round. And that reputation is likely to seed, however, in the wake of this exhibition. But in the meantime, what I will suggest is how we should make sense of Asawa the sculptor as also at the same time Asawa the draftswoman. How this work strides two and three dimensional form, drawing in close dialogue with sculpture and with the kind of spatial experience that sculpture can generate. So I'll begin with this, a line drawing of her infant son, Paul, for the way it stages, I hope, the leading phrase of my talk, durable fragility, which I've borrowed from Asawa herself. This is, without a doubt, a vulnerable body. Only five days in the light of day, the title tells us, and still uncurling its arms and legs, hands and feet, as Asawa faithfully renders to paper from the folded fetal position in which it spent some 40 weeks. Asawa traces that smallness quickly, outlining the contours of cloth diaper and wrapped shirt, even momentarily forgetting to add the edge of the tiny torso, which you'll see sort of on the left, just above the pin. This body just barely holds together. And the hand that draws is vulnerable too. Imagine, if you can, a body five days after giving birth. A body literally torn apart from one into two, still assembling itself back into shape in a daze of half sleep, soreness, and exhaustion, of too much milk, of too little milk, of visitors coming and going. This is the unending experience of corporality that is the postpartum condition. And it is astonishing to me that in all of that, Asawa mustered the concentration and energy to submit pen to paper, capturing even the details of the nappy pin and the tie of the newborn shirt, the wrinkles of wrists and the tufts of hair. She beheld the body that had been growing inside her, which was now laying on the bed beside her. And with the shrewdness of a cartographer, she captured each contour and fold. It is this unsentimental view of a caretaker looking down at his or her charge, which I know from only one other artist, the painter Alice Neal, who portrayed her grandson laid out on a blanket, receiving a fresh diaper. As the art historian Anne Wagner has written of this painting, this is that rare moment in the history of art when the artist places us as viewers, regardless of our actual identifications, in the position of mother. When the picture asks us to behold fragility with all the ethical implications that that positioning implies. Utterly dependent on another, reaching for attachment and imprinting, and not even really able to turn its head and look back, the human infant is vulnerability embodied. And Asawa rendered that durable by committing it to paper. Such precarity became lasting defeating the march of time in which it would inevitably disappear as infant grows into child, child into adolescent, and adolescent into adult. In the subsequent months and years, Asawa made several versions of this view, telescoping us above the scene. Sketches of infant Paul form the basis of a stencil, 
which Asawa used to embed the body into a field of pattern. And these marks were made by employing a method that she herself had invented, the incised felt tip of a broad ink marker, which was typically used for commercial signage at the time. Asawa had cut into this felt tip to create ruts, which allowed her, once she put pen to paper, to leave three or four or sometimes five lines clustered together at regular intervals. It furnished her with a kind of stamp, a tool to generate cross hatchings, which she oriented vertically and then horizontally, and again vertically and horizontally, along a meandering path, creating a sort of chain link of pattern. And I'll show you another version of the same scene a sheet of undulating folds that repeat as if extending endlessly beyond the edge of the paper. And it must have fascinated her to see how such simple two-dimensional marks could summon the billowing surface of a quilt or a patterned rug, a ground that didn't so much lie beneath the baby's body as it did envelop it, swirling around his small features and almost engulfing him, were it not for the bits of blank paper that Asawa had outlined and left alone. A blankness that paradoxically heightens our sense of this undulating volume. I begin with these views of vulnerability to encourage us to see anew the three-dimensional works for which Asawa is better known works which may seem, on first glance, to have little to do with drawing. These works began as experiments with a base, basic basket-making technique that she had learned in Toluca, Mexico in 1947 as a volunteer with the American Friend Service Committee, better known as the Quakers, working with local children. As she developed this technique, she extended the surface of looped wire into curved shapes, and at some point closed them to create lobes, and then an adjacent lobe, and another, until she had structures of five and six feet in length that hung freely from a fixed point above the viewer. In applications to the Guggenheim Foundation in the early 1950s, Asawa described the key concepts, and she used the words concepts, behind this means of, quote, defining a volume with the thinnest of surfaces, unquote. And she compared its making to the making of drawings, particularly, quote, line drawings, unquote. And here we see a sheet that she included in her application. And you can see how she elaborates her point. And what she's trying to convey here is how certain parts of the looped wire folds back onto itself. So that what appears to be nestled forms is actually as a single surface, which we can see in this graphic explanation of the shape. And then it's corollary in the wire, in the bottom nodule of this um, looped wire work. Maybe I'll just point that out too in case that's not clear. This is her, she's written start here. And then you can follow this line all the way around and then finish, she's written finish here. And here you can see the sort of effect. I mean, that's a graphic delineation of what this surface is doing if you can imagine, without having to see it. But fortunately, you're able to see it in person. <laughs> this was a motif akin to the Moebius strip, in which the inside surface and the outside surface were constantly changing places. And here's another example of that motif as it became integrated into ever more complex shapes. This engaged formal principles of, in her words, quote, interpretation 
interpenetration, sorry, interpenetration, transparency, the illusion of more with less, the ratio of minute weight to apparent volume, and durable fragility, unquote. This fragility, she was quick to point out, in that same application, described appearance more than actual strength. So what she meant here is that the surface seems delicate and easily damaged when in fact it was quite resilient. It could withstand pressure and deformation and return to its original shape. And here we should remember that Asawa was working at home in the 1950s while surrounded by small children who would inevitably touch or pull on these works that populated their living environment. <clears throat> this interest in the appearance of fragility across a range of durable materials owes to Asawa's training as an artist. Although she had been exposed to drawing early on and had even worked with accomplished draftsmen while a teenager and later at the Milwaukee State Teachers College, it was at Black Mountain College that she learned an approach to mark making that accompanied her throughout the rest of her life. Located in North Carolina against the backdrop of the stunning Blue Ridge Mountain Range, Black Mountain College was transforming the landscape of liberal arts education in America. Its instructors advocated for John Dewey's concept of a holistic education founded in the arts as a form of civil service. And many of them had emigrated from fascist Europe, including the German artists Josef and Annie Albers. In 1947, Asawa began taking Josef Albers' courses in design and color. Courses which by then had become legendary for their innovative approach to drawing and painting. Albers advocated that students learn to see, that the exercises would enable them to grasp perceptual nuances. And Albers famously claimed that he didn't teach students to make art nor was he even training future artists. He, he rather claimed that he was guiding them in gathering experience, in unlearning conventions of normalized perception. And in this sheet, produced for one of Albers' courses at Black Mountain College, which we can see on the floor, Asawa rendered a series of these inter interpenetrating shapes. And this was one of Albers' favored instructional tools, this particular motif, which he called the meander. Albers loved this motif because it was visually dynamic. It turns in and onto itself, exchanging exterior and interior, front and back, and even top and bottom. And Albers had students explore the full range of this dynamism, varying the thickness of line and its direction to see what kind of visual effects could result. Albers stressed the difference between what he called physical fact, or the, the material identity of any medium or object, and what he called psychic effect, the appearance that it took on under conditions of artistic transformation. In drawing and paper studies, the goal was not to copy the actual appearance of an object, but to engender its visual impression. So I'll give you an example of that difference. Exercises included purposely playing with appearances, creating a sense of pictorial depth merely through the juxtaposition of color and shape, for example. So here the slight misregistration of overlapping dark and light hourglass shapes generates our conviction that these figures are floating over the plywood and actually have a volume so that they cast a shadow, when in actuality they're paper thin. And in another example, exploring contrasting color relationships, these same motifs again, appear to be figures cut out of a blue field, 
to reveal this orange ground beneath. But then, when you look at these in raking light, it becomes clear that Asawa had added these elements on top of the blue, confounding our visual expectations. In such studies, paper becomes a vehicle to explore how color and spatial relationships are dependent on one another, are in this sense fragile, as opposed to stable pictorial elements through which an objective representation of the world might be projected. Vision here is inevitably shaped by our position as viewers to the work and by our bodies themselves. As the art historian Jeffrey Seletnik has argued in his fantastic book on Albers's pedagogy, by the way, which is brand new, he taught drawing as an embodied activity. What and how one sees depends on one's position and orientation. As succinctly captured here in this photograph in which students conform their bodies to this 45 degree angle that the drawn surface describes. Asawa began exhibiting her looped wire sculptures in the early 1950s. Initially, they were displayed in design contexts. In a New York showroom, Asawa's looped wire sculptures hung from the ceiling, and baskets were placed carefully on platform benches, visible here in the background. And her works were juxtaposed to hanging mobiles by Alexander Calder with one design magazine describing Asawa as, quote, knitting like a woman Calder. An association with so-called feminine craft, to which I'll return at the end of the talk. This was a moment in American art in which sculpture was polarized between the weightlessness of Calder's constructions and the welded steel of masculinist practitioners like David Smith. Such sculpture modeled itself after the constructivist legacy of the 1920s and 30s, in which volume shed mass and conversed with ambient light. Photography summed up what many saw as the draftsman-like character of this sculpture. It's, quote, linear, two-dimensional modality, unquote, as the art critic Clement Greenberg put it. These were sculptures that moved. And this movement, seen through the camera, created yet another work, as if sculpture in combination with photography became a kind of drawing machine. And Asawa's suspended works were also subjected to this exploration by this West Coast photographer, Paul Hassel, who rendered the work's distinctive structure here of 12 interlocking spheres into an unrecognizable, dynamic, vibrating energy of light and dark. Asawa welcomed this photographic mediation of her work and she saw the adjacent media of drawing and photography well equipped to describe her artistic aims. Two-dimensional representations could convey, as she put it, how, quote, the cast shadow of these creations have as much depth as a thing itself, unquote. A statement, as I interpret it, that speaks to Asawa's interest in how one entity could engender two. How overlappings and transparencies could multiply visual relationships, which Asawa also communicated in drawn representations of her work. And here in this, one of the more unusual examples of that, this technical process of zipatone printing to delineate the sort of multi-layered quality of texture and shadow in the looped wire works. In the early 1960s, 
Asawa's interest in the possibility of line for sculpture took a different turn. It was prompted by the gift of a spiky desert plant, which Paul Hassel and his wife Virginia had brought back from a recent trip to Death Valley. They gave the brittle object to Asawa with the suggestion that it might be of interest for her to draw. And indeed, it was. Asawa set about attempting to render the plant's complex linear structure in drawn form. And after several attempts left her unsatisfied, Asawa then turned to wire. And only then, in wire, did she find an adequate representation for what she saw when observing the plant. And this breakthrough would result in a group of works which Asawa called her tied wire pieces. Tied in that they were created by progressively dividing groups of wire strands by tying them off, also with wire, rather than welding or soldering. And in a letter to Josef Albers, she describes how this technique worked. She was in touch with Albers for many, many decades until his death in the 70s. <clears throat> and she writes, it's very exciting. For example, I have a thousand strands of wire in a bundle. I divide them into three bunches of 333 strands. And then each bunch is divided again and again until two strands are left. And I tie each joint with the same wire so there's no solder use. My tool is a pair of pliers that will cut and twist the wire. The variations are endless. Asawa experimented with this technique of endless division across many material supports beyond this three-dimensional sculpture that you see here. <clears throat> and here's the translation of this method into pen and ink, actually on a co uh, cotton handkerchief. And both of these, by the way, are in the exhibition, as many of the works that I'm showing here. And I would really encourage everyone to see them in person. Beginning with a central point, Asawa extended its dimensions methodically across the surface through regularized branching that gradually diminished in width towards the outer edges of the sheet allowing the branch, uh, branches finally to end in short staccato lines capped by small dots. In another example, these lines coalesce around an invisible border to create a kind of contained microcosm or globe. The kind of paper that Asawa often used, here designated as technical paper, was the line of tableau paper from the Technical Paper Company, this kind of extremely durable paper that could withstand, as its brochure attested, quote, several applications of ink and quite a bit of handling, unquote. And it was really ideal for multi-pass printing processes, and its affordability made it a favorite for school use, which, after the late 1960s, became an important site of artistic engagement for Asawa in the public schools in San Francisco. This dialogue between durability and fragility can also be seen in Asawa's translation of the motif into other supports, like this punched tin sheet. Here she changes how these lines are registered for us. In this instance, what we perceive as lines are not lines at all but the accumulation of these serialized dots poked holes in a metal sheet in which the background, in this case a sort of white ground on which the sheet lays, comes through to register the branching pattern. In another example, an embossing process raises parts of the metallic paper to create the pattern meaning that there's really no figure ground distinction on a material level, just these different heights within the work support. And a low uh, relief in metal, here pressed copper foil, becomes a way to equalize foreground and background. 
instead of figure dominating over ground, as is more typical in the history of art, Asawa continually swaps inside and outside, foreground and background. It's this interest in Lyne's materiality, more than what it delineated, that captured Asawa's imagination. This materiality, an exercise in fragility made durable, propelled her to explore the continuity between two and three dimensional space. And so to return again to these marker drawings, which I mentioned before, everyday objects occasioned an opportunity to think about how we perceive objects in an environment. In a bent wood chair, what mattered was how absence and presence existed in a dialogue with one another, so that chair could be rendered absent and the air around it present. Just as the caning of a rocking chair could foreground the blank body of the pet monkey belonging to one of Asawa's children. Or the bumpy texture of a woven basket could be conveyed by a single mark a single kind of mark, made in different orientations and curvatures, even as she uses the same kind of mark to transform that basket again into a load-bearing vessel through the juxtaposition of these outlined bell peppers. This is a body of work, in other words, about the fragility of our own vision about how easily we might be convinced of the presence of a fish, excuse me, <coughs> through the imprint of its rough scales and gossamer fins, with fish prints also playing a role in Asawa's work in the, with the children of San Francisco public schools. And here she's using the same durable paper that I mentioned earlier. This is an approach to drawing in which the most unlikely figures become protagonists for art, and not least of which are the school children alongside she worked. Over the decades, Asawa would develop a habitual drawing practice in which she was rarely without a pen and sketchbook in hand. She sketched household objects, <clears throat> like chairs and baskets and the pet monkey. She sketched during committee meetings, as part of her work advocating for the arts in the public schools. She sketched fellow members of the San Francisco Arts Commission. Here's the children's book author, Gary Snyder. And on a visit to France in 1983, she noted down what she saw in Cezanne's studio, an arrangement of bottles as well as figural sculptures. She uh, drew while riding the BART, the city's public transportation system, and while watching television. She sketched when she was sick and couldn't sleep. And here it's too small for, for you to see, but, <coughs> but she's written 4.05 a.m., hand unsteady. <clears throat> Although her unsteady hand is much better than all of our steady hands. <laughs> Drawing became a diaristic endeavor, bringing her through episodes of insomnia from the steroid prednisone, which treated her lupus in March 1985. And here she's, she's jotted down prednisone in the bottom left-hand corner. What's unusual about these drawings is how empty they are. Asawa drains the image of modeling and shading, and in doing so prompts us to consider her relationship to other such efforts at the time such as Andy Warhol's early drawings. Here, both artists juxtapose the commercial mass market icons of Coca-Cola and Martinelli's apple juice with cut flowers. Both are interested in the minimal means by which such objects can be delineated. And where Warhol adds shading, he does so as a mockery of plenitude. Really, no one is here convinced of the roundness of petals or stems. Both artists, in other words, reject that more established approach to drawing as the modulation of light and dark, shadow and highlighting. And I just show you here, as a contrast, a really rare, a rare work for Asawa, 
which is also in the show, um, in which she performs this more recognizable modeling using Conte crayon, which is also unusual for her. And it had come to symbolize this sort of epitome of advanced drawing. <clears throat> Rejecting this approach, Asawa instead preferred the illustrator's technique of blotted pen lines and brushed ink, playing with the absorptive quality of the paper. This is what she had learned from Albers, who forbade shading, having the students instead learn how few marks were needed to generate recognition from the viewer. The quality of line becomes so tenuous in these works that we have the sense that it might snap at any moment and shatter the illusion of a forearm or sleeve. <clears throat> and it may seem strange to compare Warhol and Asawa to align the stay-at-home mom volunteering at her kid's school with the queer icon of pop art. But both challenge the heteronormative expectations of mid-century art. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the drawn work of both, we see what art critic and historian Benjamin Buchlow has called the, quote, demasculinization of drawing, stripping the medium of its heroism and pronouncements of authenticity. Bodies and bouquets here only barely hold together. Where the two importantly differ, however, is in the horizon of this demasculinization. Warhol repeatedly performed the deadening of the senses left by mass culture's glut of imagery, a deadening in which even erotically charged fl floral painting becomes lifeless. And Asawa also emptied such forms of plenitude and their historical association with fertility but she registers these forms in a network of intimate gestures and relationships. A flower is given on Mother's Day. And here, the, it's again noted in the bottom left, on, in her work on the left. And purple irises from her daughter conveyed in these vivid pools of ink to create an effect of systemended uh, fluidity, <clears throat> which you see here on the right. Asawa's interest in the contour line was part of an interest in the materiality of ink, in pen, watercolor, and paper, exploring how flatness and fullness exist side by side. And many of these works are unintelligible without an understanding of Asawa's commitment to friends and family, which for her meant a commitment to shared making, doing, and learning. And this really wasn't about policing gender roles or imposing discipline for its own sake or even defending so-called traditional values. This was about recognizing one's responsibility to others and insisting that art has a role to play in that recognition. Indeed, insisting that that is its purpose. such as this drawing, for example, made in 1955 and then gifted to its sleeping sitter nearly 40 years later. Happy birthday, Hudson, signed mom. This is a vision of materiality as intrinsically related to mothering, beyond the etymological link that the word material encases the Latin word for mother or mater. This was work that welcomed monotony and repetition. And her, Asawa herself compared making art to the activities of knitting, crocheting, and gardening in order to convey this repetitiveness. It's art making as the opposite of heroic acts of genius, as the practice of beauty in the cyclical and unglamorous rhythms of life. Art as an outgrowth of the underpaid, underrecognized work of cleaning, cooking, and caretaking, for which motherhood is a sign, unhinged from gender. So in closing, I'll leave you with one last instance of drawing in Asawa's work. Perhaps the most fragile of all, 
which is this chalkboard that was a permanent feature in her household in a kind of maternal rendition of Cy Twombly's graffito. The chalkboard served as the receptacle of household scribbles. It is art brought down low. And I imagine from this picture, it was used both by a Sawa, who I suspect made this quite elegant circular figure, as well as by her kids and neighboring kids. <clears throat> of course, these chalkboard drawings no longer exist. But traces of them are preserved in Hassel's photographs, staging yet another dialogue between two and three dimensions, between scribbles and looped wire. <clears throat> and at some point, this photo was used for a brochure that accompanied Asawa's 1958 solo show at a New York art gallery. And you can see how on that occasion, in the cropping of the photo, the chalkboard disappears leaving only the wire sculptures. It's a seemingly innocuous gesture, surely made to focus the attention of potential visitors. But it speaks volumes to us now, knowing how Asawa was for so long written out of art history. She was written out because she refused to separate her identity as a mother from her identity as a modernist artist. And to do this was virtually unheard of in mid-century America. As the art critic Lucy Lepard wrote in 1973, looking back, women were considered part-time artists if they worked for a living outside of art, or were married, or had a child. And as a result, they didn't have to be taken seriously." Quote. Asawa's gallerists wanted Asawa to be taken seriously, and so excerpted evidence of her children. And incidentally, a year later, that same gallery also declined her request to exhibit her drawings, to have a drawings show. Also likely wanting Asawa to be taken seriously. And you're probably not surprised when I tell you that not long after, Asawa lost interest in fancy exhibitions in New York. And fortunately, this exhibition at the Minnell makes good on that request from Asawa that her drawings be shown. And it's my hope that soon we'll recognize what a difference the artist mother made to the course of modern art. However belatedly, we're gradually catching up to what Asawa was trying to tell us. Thank you. So I would be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you all so much for coming. If you raise your hand, I have a mic here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely magnificent. I oh, wanted to you. ask you about um, a particular image that you showed, mm. which is of the baby on the blanket, but the one mm. that's... To me, that right. uh, image has a kind of a cosmic energy to it, and I wondered if you could just speak to what I see as a, a kind of a spiritual dimension in many of the works. Um, that's an interesting reading. <clears throat> In, in some ways, I, you know, I never knew her, and I don't know what her relationship to spirituality was. Um, when I look at the works, though, I see a kind of um, meditative quality, for sure. Um, I'm seeing if I can f return to the one that you referenced. Um, and in that sense, I think there's, there's really something to be said about that. Um, I think... <clears throat> you know, in some ways, she's a very she's a materialist too. Um, extremely interested in the kinds of tools she's using um, and the kind of inks and papers um, that are available to her, and thinking about pattern and visual pattern also as um, as a form of materiality. But um, but surely one can also think about meditative qualities in works like this that are sort of uh, 
like re-performed for us too when we look at them. And I hope there's also um, a drawing of a redwood, a bisected redwood tree where you can also imagine that uh, your own experience with that is quite meditative when you're looking at it. Yeah, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Yeah, please. <clears throat> Since she studied at Black Mountain, was she also influenced by Annie Albers and the weaving? I and mean, that looks like weaving to me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because <clears throat> the, the terms of, of you know, this uh, often this is referred to as the woven surface of the paper or the knitted looped wire sculptures. It's this metaphor of weaving and knitting and crocheting is throughout the reception of her work and and how people have talked about it dating from some of the earliest exhibition reviews. And I mentioned one that's half derogatory and half complimentary in this weird way. Um, and she never was able to take a course with Annie Albers. She tried at one point and Annie Albers um, said, well, I can't teach you weaving in six weeks, something like this. I think it was our summer session. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. And she said, go take the, the course with Josef Albers. <laughs> um, so she never actually took a course with Annie Albers, um, but uh, others have written beautifully I think actually Isabel Bird, if she's in the audience, um, who is a pre-doctoral fellow at the Manil, or was, was, is no longer, has um, compared some of Asawa's stamped works with some of Annie Albers's patterns that she made on paper, these like texture material studies where you know, she would repeat um, the, the close of a parenthesis all over a page, for example, and it would create this texture, or um, using corn kernels and covering the page with them. And it was this way that she uh, sensitized her students to, to really texture of fabrics and pattern without having, um, uh, without having those materials ready at hand. They were using, they were using what they could find yeah, so of the time. Um, and the conditions in which they were working. But, and, and so certainly there's some of that there. And also Annie Albers and Josef Albers were in this extremely close uh, working dialogue um, to, to a point where it's very difficult to pull apart whose idea was belonged to whom. And I think in that sense, one can also say that, that, that Annie Albers' thinking um, is also playing a big role in Asawa's um, approach to some of these issues. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Would you agree that um, Ruth Asawa really accomplished or achieved one of the major principles and ideas of avant-garde, at least from the Bauhaus, because Joseph Albers was his was her was her teacher, and he was uh, before he had been at the Bauhaus, um, bringing together life <laughs> and art uh, because this is what she did apparently. She was a mother, as you said, mm -hmm. housewife, um, constantly drawing and and doing her art, and that was also an idea that Joseph Albers and also. Laszlo Molinoch had in their fundamental course, uh, because we don't, um, or we must not forget that Albers uh, had this course in the in the Bauhaus in the 1920s, and then continued his working, slightly different way certainly at the Black Mountain College. So, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think that's um, a fantastic way to think about it. Her sort of taking this idea that originates in the 20s in a specific historical context and um, digesting it and then taking it in a direction that could have never been anticipated by those practitioners. Um, and I, I think you can really make that argument well when you start looking at her work in the public school system 
where the very concept of the aesthetic as a realm set apart, um, confined to museums and galleries, falls a apart. And art is really integrated into everyday life, and including you know, a complete democratization of who, of who can be an artist and what the artwork looks like. and. Um, and the kind of value attached to that object, the, the, the work that she's doing as part of the Alvarado School Arts Workshop um, very much achieves some of these goals originally set out at the Bauhaus and, and also takes similar, very concretely takes similar strategies, like at the preliminary course in the Bauhaus, making material studies and then taking them apart again and not preserving them because they're exercises, which they did at Black Mountain too, but then Josef Albers does keep a lot of them <laughs> and preserves them because they're so fantastic and then gives them to the Harvard Art Museums and now and now we have them to look at. And, and in the Alvarado School Arts Workshop, all we have are these photographs of many, many things that were made and were never kept. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. No, she didn't write much about her own work. Um, what I mentioned was from a fund, it was a, a grant application, which is very short. But when she does, it's very precise language and it's very um, pragmatic language and very accessible. And um, they, she did write a statement on arts education. Um, and a few statements like this that come out, that come really out of a need to communicate a certain idea or on the occasion of an exhibition when she's trying to represent um, something like the Alvarado School Arts Program without being able to show its full spectrum of activities. But no, she's not a writer. She's um, one of these um, artists' artists. <laughs> Hi. Uh, do we know the collaborative practice between um, Ruth and uh, Paul? Oh, this is a story waiting to be told. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so Paul is this very accomplished uh, ceramic artist, and they work together quite closely um, as under the umbrella of the public school um, arts advocism, but um, in other contexts as well. And this is like, this is, would be a fantastic dissertation to write. Um, the, if anyone visits the Bay Area anytime soon, you can see these masks that Asawa cast of visitors to her home, which uh, was recently acquired by the Cantor Art Center and are now on view. And right next to them, they're juxtaposed with uh, several vessels by Paul. And that's beginning this extremely interesting dialogue um, over, uh, in that instance across clay between the two figures. But I think that this uh, is really ripe for, for further research, as if the Asawa state needs more to do. But <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, could you talk about the larger project of which this is a part? Is Asawa a kind of opening figure for the project? And what are all the other artists included? Yeah, so <clears throat> some of the other artists included are Imogen Cunningham, who for those of you for whom that name is not familiar, she's a photographer also working in the Bay Area in California and <clears throat> about 40 years older than Ruth Asawa. But they become friends quite quickly when Asawa moves to San Francisco uh, in 1940, the summer of 1949, and remain quite close friends until Cunningham's death in uh, 1976, I think. And so she plays a role, um, uh, Mary Rank, the jewelry artist also, um, and, and several other figures whose names I, I don't, Nancy Thompson or Mai Lee or um, uh, the architectural historian and, and artist um, Sally Woodbridge. But 
so yeah, so Asawa is this uh, through line. It's sort of a, a networked monograph or something um, where Asawa is put into dialogue with these other figures and making this argument that uh, this this un, uh, unofficial group, um, unofficial art movement of of a sort, uh, where they all really couldn't care less about the official art world and art forum, and are just doing their own thing, um, and continually insist that their labor as mothers augments and supports their uh, labor as artists, which was really such a such a difficult claim to make at that time. I can't overstate that. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm getting a nod that maybe we should wrap up. All right. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Trey. Thank I just you want so to remind much. everybody yeah. the gallery's open. <laughs>